We have already done the first kinematic formula. The first kinematic formula that we did was distance traveled d is some average velocity v bar times t in general, right? That's what, that's what we have already done. So now we'll go to the other kinematic formulas that we'll be, that we'll be dealing with now. And these are important formulas. You need to memorize them. You need to make sure how to use them. And most importantly, you need to get familiar with the sign conventions that we need to use as we get into these kinematic formulas. So let's take a simple problem. We'll do a thought experiment, OK? In other words, we'll think about an experiment. Uh, we can't really do a real experiment here. So a thought experiment is that suppose uh, there are multiple levels. like that. Imagine that these are like various diving boards, all right? And here you are uh, diving uh, into the water. Suppose this is a very simple dive. You just drop yourself. And this is, let's say, level one, OK? And this is, let's say, level two. And this is, let's say, level three. On Earth, we know very well that there is an acceleration due to gravity, right? Because if, we, if I drop this shock, it's going to fall. Now, it turns out that it's very well known that this acceleration due to gravity uh, is going to drag things downward. So we will put an arrow downward like this just to mark that this is acceleration due to gravity. Things will go down and not go up or stay there. And for now, provisionally, we just write the symbol g, small g, that is. Small g is a symbol, not capital G, never use capital G. Small g is a symbol used to describe acceleration due to gravity. So we are doing an experiment right now. So suppose here you are, and you drop something. OK? So you drop something, and when, when I say the word drop, the word drop has a very technical meaning in physics. So if I ever use the word drop, you should immediately realize that what I'm trying to tell you is that the initial velocity with which it is being released, g0, is precisely equal to 0. That's what the word drop means in physics. So when I say drop, you read between the lines. You don't read it like, oh, drop. No, drop means v0 is equal to 0. Never make that mistake. OK? So v0 is equal to 0, v0 being the initial velocity, or vi, whatever you call it. This essentially is described by the word drop, to drop something. So here you drop something. That means your v0 is equal to 0. And what you want to measure, let's say, somehow, and we have very precise measurement techniques, is what is the velocity? just before it hits the ground or hits the water, just before, OK? It's a very subtle concept. It's not when it has already hit the water or already hit the ground. It is in the instant before it hits the ground to the extent you can measure that instant. Okay? So we call it define. Very commonly, define. So it turns out then that suppose you want to measure, because we are doing an experiment, suppose you want to measure uh, in, the, in the experiment that you really did, uh, and you plot time along the x-axis, and you measure the v final along the y-axis. You have some device with which you can measure very accurately. And that's not difficult to do. It will turn out that since you are dropping it, at t equal to 0, when you drop it, presumably that's when you start your timer, at t equal to 0, uh, v0 is 0. So velocity will turn out to be 0. Uh, next up, at a finite t, let's say you'll get some other velocity, v, uh, v final, let's say from level 1. So from level 1, if you drop this and you measure the velocity here, you'll find some v final value. Let's say now you go to level two, and you do the same thing. You repeat the same experiment. Again, you drop it. 
and you find now that you have dropped it from a higher level, the velocity is a little higher, so therefore you'll wind up at some other point, a little higher, all right? Um, my points are not going to align up very well, so I'll make them bigger so I can run a line through. And then if I go to level three, the velocity will be even higher, and now say I'll end up somewhere here, and so on. So it will turn out, if I make a plot of V final versus G, it will be some kind of a line like this. Of course, there will be some measurement error. If there were no errors at all, those crosses will be perfectly fitting. But you'll be able to make a very nice line like that. So this line obviously has a slope, right? And therefore, you can measure the slope. The easiest way to measure the slope is by figuring out two different times and the corresponding different velocities. So not just like we did on, on last uh, Tuesday, so this is one number, let's call it v final 2, let's call this v final 1, and let's call this correspondingly t2 over t1. Suppose I can make this measurement, and if I make this measurement, so I'll get v final 2 minus v final 1 divided by t2 minus t1, and that will give me the slope of my line. Okay, that will give me the slope of my line. So the slope of my line, let's figure out what the slope really means physically, because all these things have a physical meaning. So velocity is, what are the units of velocity? Anybody? Yeah. Meters per second. So meters per second would be length over time, right? So if I do a dimensional analysis, I will put length here, over time on the top, downstairs I'll just put time because it's t, and therefore I'll end up with the following. I'll end up with I'll end up with a quantity. Somebody is very late. Oh, somebody is leaving. All right. So L uh, divided by t division by t means times one over t. So that would be L over T squared. And this happens to be the dimension of acceleration. So in this case, it turns out that what I'll end up getting is actually this value of G from my, from my measurements, if I could actually make the measurements. So this will turn out to be what I would call this G. And in fact, if you could do a very precise measurement, experiments are difficult to do. Making precise experiments are very difficult to do as well. But if you could do one, it will turn out that the value of G, depending upon where you are on the planet, would be roughly equal to 9.80 meters per second squared. All right? So. In terms of significant figures, this has three significant figures, and that's typically the default one that we'll use. So when you're doing homework, since I'm making up the homework, I'm typically giving you a number like g equals 9.80 meters per second squared. And actually, it's in your formula sheet that I've placed on UB Learns. Now, I'll get into significant figures in more detail later. But right now, for our purposes, in class, and when we are doing the quizzes, because in the quizzes, we don't need to really get into a lot of significant figure calculations in great detail. We we'll do some of it. But right now, we can approximate that for our purposes as 10 meters per second squared, for now. So for class use between us, when we are not doing the homework, we'll assume that it's about 10 meters per second squared, right? So, so therefore, if this thing falls for one second, you see, it will turn out that uh, the final velocity will be about 10 meters per second. If it falls for two seconds, it will be 20 meters per second, because that's what that proportionality is going to give us, that, that thing. So in other words, what we are finding is that V final, in this case, is some acceleration, in this case our G times T, for the falling body.
So this slope that we found, this, this equation is basically V final equals G times T. That's what we have done. All right, any questions so far? Cool. Now suppose you don't drop it. Suppose you throw it down. You throw it down with a V0 that is not equal to V. Suppose you, you actually give it a V0, and that V0, let's say, is 2 meters per second. So you give it a V0. So now if I record the numbers, uh, just like I made the plot before, what I'll end up with, let me, let me do it here. What I'll end up with is a plot like this. Again, I have T. Again, I have V final. But instead of starting at the origin, this line will start here, and this will be my dz. The slope will again be of course g, because the slope will be acceleration due to gravity. So therefore, I should be able to generalize this formula, because that formula is only useful when v0 is exactly equal to 0, right? when I drop it. But if I don't drop it, if I actually throw it, then it'll be v final equals v0 plus gt. So that will be my formula. I won't put it in a box quite as yet, because g is very special here. We have taken a very special g. We have taken a g that is acceleration due to gravity. We have also taken a g which is constant. So in general, there is nothing sacred about using g. right? So what I can do is I can write, in general, what my thought experiment tells me is that V final is equal to V0 plus some acceleration times T. And this acceleration doesn't have to be G. It is just a constant acceleration. All right? That is my second formula. The kinematics formulas, you have to keep them in your head continuously because you'll need them as you do every problem for a long, long time. So for now and for a long time, I'll call it formula two. All right. So the next one, again, let's go back and let us do some kind of study of the distance through which it falls. So let's call it, in this case, because it's vertical, let's call it height through which. fall transpires. All right? Height to which the fall transpires. So we now, we now want to measure this height, because thus far, we have only worried about the final velocity. What is the velocity? Just at the instant when it's about to touch the ground. But now we want to find out about the height. So we don't really have too many tools. But we do have an important tool here. We have our formula one. And formula one deals with distance. In this case, we can use formula one in the context of vertical motion. Previously, we talked about formula one as you were floating in the rocket in the context of horizontal motion. But now we can deal with it in the context of vertical motion. Suppose that the height, because it is vertical, I call it y. I'll teach you how to measure height. You have to now get used to using the right kind of sign conventions as you measure height. Okay? And this is tricky. And 80% of you will screw this up and will lose points and learn it the hard way. So I hope it doesn't come to that, but usually it ends up being like that. So what I want to say is I want to use equation 1 and say y is some kind of average velocity times the fall time. All right. So almost any quantity can be averaged. How accurately you average it might vary. But almost any quantity can be averaged. So in this case, we already know two velocities. We already know that I have a v0 when I let the motion start. That's my drop, or if I throw it down, my v0. 
and I also know there is a V final. So these two velocities I know. I may not know other velocities, but these two I really, really know. Which means I can really, really compute an average velocity if I take the sum of these two velocities and divide that by 2. And then stick the T here. Nothing stops me from doing that, you see. So now, I actually have an expression for this, but furthermore, I actually have equation 2. So I would say 2 implies, this means implies, V final is V0 plus AT. So I should be able to write, or I can make it G for now and, and make it A later. Uh, so I can say, because it's vertical motion, I can write this is V0 plus V final is V0 plus AT, right, or GT, sorry. And this is divided by 2. So let me put a big bracket here times time. I haven't done anything new. I've just stuck equation 2 into what I got. It's already kind of interesting. Because if I open up these brackets, I have one V0 here and another V0 here. So I have two V0, right? These two terms add up to two V0. I have plus GT uh, divided by two times T. Are all of you with me? Or has any, anybody lost me? There is no shame in telling me that you lost me. If you, if you lost me, just stick your hand and we'll go over it quickly again. All right? So everybody agrees that this is, this is okay? So if that's the case, then you see I can divide by 2 here. Instead of having a, an ugly 2 here, I'll just cancel out the 2 and I'll make it V0T and there'll be a half plus 1 half GT squared. Now those of you who, who have gotten really, really rusty with fractions, what this means, this, this means this term divided by 2 plus that term divided by 2. It's only when you have this and the denominator is the same that you can write that expression. So this is how you basically break it up. And therefore you have your formula 3 which, in, which for the vertical, vertical drop problem or vertical rise problem, that's a vertical problem. We call it y equals v0 plus, I'm sorry, v0 t plus one half gt squared. Okay, so this is our third equation that we have derived. However, this equation was derived with that example in mind. So everything was made vertical. So I don't have to make everything vertical. Things can be accelerating along a flat surface also. There is nothing I have done that is so special that this can't be used for those studies. So in general, I can write x or y, let's call it x equals v0t plus one half a, a being any constant acceleration, so this is constant, times t. So we have equations one, two, and three so far. All right. So these will be our bread and butter. So all the all the problems I gave you, well, not all of them. Most of them end up using these kinematic equations that we will cut our teeth in for this week and and a bit of the next and the next. One of the things that I want you to notice is that, without really saying very much, for simplicity's sake, we have restricted our studies for now to cases where the acceleration is constant. This is special. In most real life scenarios, acceleration may not be constant. It just turns out that when things fall, acceleration is naturally constant. And that's why vertical motion Vertically something coming downward, vertically something being thrown upward, 
a projectile and blah, blah, blah. These are extremely important examples of doing kinematic problems. So all of the equations we have derived so far, you see one, uh, two, and three, they have time in them. So it would be possible, therefore, to use these equations to actually find a relationship where time does not come in. Now you might wonder why. What's the problem with time coming in? There is no real problem with time coming in. It's just that sometimes the time information may not really be there. It may not be possible for you to infer or quickly or directly calculate time. So in those cases, you would like to have some tool available where you can deal without explicitly knowing time. So, in other words, you want to find one formula where time is not important. So let's start with uh, equation, equation two, and we will deal with vertical motion for now, and then we can generalize to vertical and horizontal motion as long as acceleration is constant. So in vertical motion case, equation two implies that v final is v0 plus, because it is vertical motion, I'll put in a gt. So from here, I can easily calculate an expression for time, pretending I know everything else. So I can write then gt, is it, I take v0 to the other side and just turn it around, v final minus v0. So gt is v final minus v0. v0 is taken to the left side, and hence v0 becomes a negative point. So then I can easily write t as v final minus v0 divided by g. So that will be my new expression for time t. And we also have equation 3. In this case, we'll call it y because we are dealing with vertical motion. y equals v0 t <coughs> plus 1 half g t squared. So let's do something very brave. Let's see what happens if we take time from equation 2's thing that we got and stick it in equation 3 because it gives us a way to eliminate time if we put this t in terms of vf minus v0 over g here. So let's do that. It's a little bit of algebra, so bear with me. Follow me closely, though. Uh, there are right ways and wrong ways of doing algebra, even, even if the wrong way gives you the right result. I'd rather that you do it the right way and minimize your chances of error, because that's what the right ways are all about. They're about minimizing your chances of error. So one of the things that you learn in 101 is how to catch your own error. Okay? This, you, you've got to be really good. I can tell you ahead of time that if you want an A or a B plus in this course, you have to be really good at catching your error. Because I can't tell you how many times you'll make an error in every problem. And it's not just you. It's me too. If I don't have my lecture notes, I'll also start making little errors here and there. The difference is that as you get older and as you know the stuff, as you learn the stuff, you become better and better in catching your own errors. Okay, that, that's, the, that's the main thing. So here I'm trying to tell you that we will do this bit, bit of algebra in a somewhat careful way. We first observe that there is a g here, there is a g here, and there is a g squared here which means both these terms have a denominator of a single g, right? Because this g is there. If I rewrite this, if I rewrite it like this, let's say, if I say this is square and this is square, because square was over the whole thing, and then I cancel this g 
with one of the G's there, then I'm really left with one G downstairs in both the terms. So I can then multiply both sides by G, which will give me a GY equals V0, V final minus V0 plus one half V final minus V0 squared. Agreed or no? Anybody, anybody lost me here? Yes. I multiplied all through by G. So I had a G downstairs in each of the terms. So you see, I have a G here, right? And I, at the end of the day, I have a single G here. So if I multiply both sides of the equation by the same quantity, the equation remains the same. Yeah, why are you so far back? I won't be able to see anything from there. So this is GY. Okay. All right. This should be near, nearer. It's a very bad idea to sit at the back because you'll be writing gibberish after a while. So anyway, so GY is this, okay? That doesn't mean I don't want you to ask questions. Please ask questions, but don't learn the wrong thing. Now, if you look at this, you can simplify this. No need to talk. So you can simplify this. Because you can easily see that this factor shows up in both the terms. Right? So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pretend that that will help if I take this guy out and write V0 plus 1 half and leave one of the factors here. I'm going to pretend. I'm just, I'm just doing it on, on a gut feeling. I don't really know what will happen. So now you see something, something quite nice happen. So GY now. All right, the first term is Vf minus V0 multiplied by this term here in the second bracket. So I have V0 minus a half V0, right? So I have V0, if I open it out, it will be half Vf minus half V0. So I have a V0 and a minus a half V0, so I have a half V0, and then I have a plus half V final which means I should be able to take the half out and write V final minus V0 times V final plus V0. See how much simplified life became because I was just trying to be careful as I went through my calculations. So if you have, if you have A minus B times A plus B, you should know the answer to that. You know it, right? Show me. Oh, one brave soul has shown me. So let's multiply it out. Because clearly some of you are not sure. So A times A is A square. A times plus B is plus AB. B times A is AB, but there's a minus sign. So minus AB, B times B is B square. So uh, sorry, B, uh, B times B is B squared, but there's a minus sign. So you see, A plus B times A minus B should indeed be A squared minus B squared. You need to brush up your algebra. The best way to do that is go to Khan Academy and dig up all the algebra stuff that's there. And it's extremely useful because before you know it, it's going to bite you real bad. It's going to bite you so bad that you'll have to drop the class. So if you're, if you're not on top of algebra, by all means, get yourself fixed up. So now you see, we have the job of finishing up this work. So we can write GY is uh, half GY. There's a half here, so I'll pull that on the other side. V final squared minus V0 squared. All right, I just took the half to the other side. In other words, I multiplied both sides by two. So 
I now have my fourth formula, which does not involve time, which I would rewrite for a vertical case as v final square is v0 square plus 2gy. That's the standard way of writing for vertical motion. Okay? So, so in general, which means horizontal motion included, I can write v final square is v0 square plus 2 any constant acceleration and let's call it in general x instead of y because x can be horizontal you can call x and make it you can make x into a y and make it vertical whatever so this is my equation 4 for now and i'll be referring to these guys as equations 1 2 3 and 4 without necessarily writing them on the board which implies that I want you not only to be able to derive them, but also to memorize them. All right, so at this point, I must tell you you guys are in trouble. You do this in another class, you will not get a quiz, both of you. So, uh, I've been telling you a lot of things, but I haven't been I haven't been explaining them and you haven't caught me. So one of the things I've been telling you is for example acceleration. I've also used the word velocity, I think, right? Have I? I have. I haven't told you what it is. Not technically. So I have been using X and Y, but I haven't really gotten into the detail, the technical detail of what these quantities are. To some degree it's important and perhaps not so important, but let me just tell you anyway, because we'll need this. So in physics, there are, well, for now, there are two kinds of guys that we deal with, uh, the scalars and the vectors. Okay? So who are the scalars? Scalars are quantities which are designated by one number, one numerical value. For example, I can tell you that the distance between Buffalo and Rochester is about 65 miles. So this distance here is only signified by one number, which is the distance between Buffalo and Rochester. And it doesn't matter whether we go from Buffalo to Rochester or whether we come from Rochester to Buffalo. Right? It's 65 miles regardless. This is a scalar quantity because directionality doesn't matter. Speed is a scalar quantity. By the way, that equation one that I wrote, that equation one is actually also valid to an extent when you use scalar quantities. Now, what are vectors? Vectors are same guys as scalars, but they have direction high to them. So velocity actually is a vector, all right? So I can say I'm going from Buffalo to Rochester and that is 65 miles per hour. And then I can technically say that my displacement, which is a vector, from Buffalo to Rochester has a magnitude of 65 miles, not much, 65 miles, and a distance which is eastward. All right. So that is a vector. So it has a sense of direction and it has a magnitude. So, so displacement, therefore, is a vector. In this case, when I write x and y, I'm actually thinking of displacement. So in other words, you see the thing came down. When I dropped the ball from level 1 or level 2 or level 3, it actually came down. So there was a directionality to it. And there was a distance tied to it, if you measure. So all these equations that we derive, these equations are equations that are useful when you have vectors involved. Now, we didn't use vector notation, nor is it necessary as long as you know how to manage them, and you will. But there is something important here, and that's a sign convention. So for now, actually for a long time, for the next month or so, we will get stuck in a certain sign convention. The sign convention is particularly important when we are dealing with vertical motion, which we'll be dealing with quite a bit right now. 
So let us say that we go to our problem. This is level one, okay? And here I drop something that goes down. So we will now adopt a science invention in which the downward direction we will say is negative. And the upward direction we will say is positive. All right? So I ask that you don't violate this convention until I ask you to violate this convention. And I will ask you to violate this for your own convenience. So in this case, the acceleration due to gravity g is downward. g has a numerical value of 9.80 meters per second squared. We know that. So just to be clear, the numerical value of g, I will implicitly mean that, just the magnitude of g. I may not write it all the time, but that's implicitly what I mean, the magnitude of g. That's 9.80 meters per second squared. But in this case, because I've taken g to be downward as per my sign convention, just to remind myself I don't want to screw it up, I'll put a minus sign there, all right? See, in this case, if I drop something from here, then that object, let's say the particle, the ball, or whatever, is actually going downward. What I'll do is that the point where I drop it, I call it y equal to 0. So that's my origin. That's the point from which I, de I define up or down. I've dropped it. It goes down. And therefore, the y value, as the ball falls, will become progressively more negative. All right? And that's how we will understand in our calculation, just so that because we are dealing with vectors, we don't screw up the sign. It's very important that you don't screw up the sign, because you will get terribly, terribly wrong results. And I don't want you to get confused there. So as we go downward in this problem, y is going to be negative. If, on the other hand, instead of dropping the ball, if I threw it up, my g would be negative because acceleration would, would not go upward. It will still be downward. But you see y, because it's going up, would be positive with respect to y comes g. So this is the positive direction. And this would be my negative direction. And I will define my origin at the level from which I'm dropping. My origin can be moved. So if I drop at level 1, my origin can get level 1. If I drop at level 2, along with me, I'll take my origin to level 2 and measure y from there. So there is nothing which is terribly sacred about having to keep the origin fixed. But your origin should be fixed enough such that you get your calculations correctly. So this is one important aspect of the sign convention. So we are dealing with vectors. So just so that you know that scalars only have magnitude and vectors have both magnitude and direction. So therefore, y is a displacement vector, v is a velocity vector, g is an acceleration vector. These are all vectors. In one dimension, things are simpler. That's why we start with 1d. Up is positive, down is negative. That takes care of your signs. The next chapter will be two dimensions, and there we will be needing to do just a few more things more carefully. And we will be using a lot of trig. All right? So if you haven't done trig in a long time, which is not uncommon, for 101 students, please brush up your trick this week. It will help you greatly from having a disastrous second week or third week. By the way, the quizzes start Thursday. Okay, so all this stuff that everything I do from day one until the previous class is in the quiz, just so that you know. And in the quiz, my goal is to, is to trip you up so I can help you fix your problem before it gets late.
quizzes are not meant to be kind, they are meant to get you. And that's what will make you a better student. Quizzes are meant to really hit your... You sure you want to talk? You sure you want to talk? Don't try that. So, they're meant to get you. In a good way. I'm there to help you. But I designed the quizzes such that you get tripped up. And very soon you'll learn to get my mind and you'll be blowing through them very well. But it is a learning process and it works very well. That's why I do it. All right, let's go to significant figures very quickly. I promised you that I'll come back to significant figures. Significant figures is very easy, okay? So there is absolutely no reason why one should get tripped up in significant figures. There's nothing difficult about it. So the idea of significant figures comes around because no measurement is perfect. In fact, uh, I'm a theoretician myself as a physicist, and I can tell you that I deal with numbers in a relatively sloppy way most of the time. Because I'm interested in getting order of magnitude stuff right, I'm interested in getting numbers roughly right, and as long as, long as they're roughly right, I'm usually pretty okay with it, as long as I know that this is the right thing that I'm doing. Sometimes you have to, you have to worry about precision, and that's okay. I know when to worry about precision, and I do that. However, I also collaborate and work every day with a lot of experimentalists who are my colleagues and friends. So I can tell you that they are trained very differently. I'm not trained to be an experimentalist, but I've spent enough time in their labs to tell you that they're trained very differently. Because to them, a measurement, which to me is just a number at the end of the day as a theorist, is a really big deal. Because they stand by that number. When they make a measurement, if it says 1.85 centimeters or 1.83 centimeters or 1.82 centimeters, it really matters to them because when they say that number, that means they really know it. That means that it's known as precisely as measurable in, on the planet. Okay? That's what it means. So therefore, precision of measurement is very important. Now imagine, centimeters, of course, is a very large unit. We can actually see and measure it with a ruler and all that. But when you do an experiment where you have just two atoms interacting, and you can actually image those atoms, and you know how far apart they roughly are experimentally, that's a big deal. Quantum computers are made out of those atoms. They are slightly off means your quantum computer is not worth a dime, perhaps. So you see, measurement is a, is a very big deal and a very important game. So when I when an experimentalist says, let's say, let's forget about centimeters, let's say 1.82 nanometers, 10 to the minus 9 meters, and says, I'm not really sure about this number. I've made many measurements, and it's 1.82, 1.81, 1.80, 1.84. I'm not really sure. But I can tell you that 1.8 is definitely right, but that third number, I'm not really sure. So I can put an error bar. I can say it's 1.82, let's say plus minus 0 0.05 nanometer. This is how an experimentalist will report it. That means it could be as high as 1.87 or as low as 1.77, but 1.77 would be rounded off as 1.8, right? Because it's more than 1.75. So what you can say is that in a case like this, these two are the significant figures. Those two are known for a fact. No matter what happens, those numbers are written in stone in the measurement. People know that. So that's what significant figures really mean. So suppose now I make a measurement like that, where I get a number, which is 1.805, a much more precise number, let's say in the same unit. When I write 1.805, when an experimentalist writes 1.805, it really means that this experimentalist is telling you that this number is known to four significant figures. All right? 
So that's easy enough. This is not rocket science. Uh, but there are certain things. For example, the number actually is 180 or so, but these are the only two significant figures that we know for a fact. So how do you write that? Well, uh, this, if you write it like this, it, it, it means that there are three significant figures. So it's, you, you surely can't write, write it like this if you have only two significant figures. That's not, that's not possible. That's wrong. So 180, the moment you write 180, it means that there are three significant figures. So if it actually has two significant figures, you can write 18 times 10. That is a number, that is a way of writing the two significant figures. Alternately, you can also write 1.8 times 10 to the 2. Both of them are correct. Both of them have two significant figures. But if I write 1.80 times 10 to the 2, there are three significant figures. That means that 0 is perfectly known. Okay? Be very careful. Okay. So two significant figures here, two significant figures here, and I've written it in the following way to basically express the same number the right way, because I know it to two significant figures as I said here. Suppose I have a number which is 0 0.50. How many significant figures does it have? Yes, two. Anybody else who disagrees with two? You can disagree by the way. The answer is 2 because that 0 doesn't count. That 0 depends upon what system of measurement I'm using, literally. So that 0 is not very important. Zero, uh, if it were 10, it would have been important. But if it is only 0, it's not important. These are the only two numbers that matter. These are the two significant figures. Because when I write 0.50, that means I know both of them. If I wasn't sure about the 0, I would simply write a 0.5 that would give me only one significant figure. But if I write 0 0.50, that means two significant figures. If I write 0 0.50000000, that means significant figures, excepting for the zero and the point. Another important thing, suppose you get a number which is 0 0.043. This number, by the way, has two significant figures because the zero before the decimal doesn't matter. Only two significant figures. Why? For the same reason that the zero after the decimal doesn't matter, because it depends upon the, the, the measurement units you select. You can't just change your measurement units and become more precise, you see. So when you write a number 0 0.043, 4 and 3 are the ones that are precisely known. That zero is immaterial, and the zero before that is immaterial. However, if I write 0 0.0430, that does have three significant figures, because that does mean that I know that last zero, otherwise I wouldn't be writing. So when I tell you that you do your calculation with two significant figures in the homework, or three significant figures in the homework, which I have, then it turns out that what you need to be able to do is carry out your calculation, perhaps with a little bit more significant figures, but then round off at the very end the significant figures that are needed. You shouldn't carry too many significant figures. It might throw off your calculation, because at that point, you're using calculators. So in general, you'll see in the formula sheet I've given, I've told you how many significant figures to use in the conversion. That's just to give you a hint as to what kind of significant figures I would use if I were doing the calculations, and the answers are set in that way. So if you have any issues with the answers, let me know. One of you told me that something is not coming out right. It may be a typographical error. It may be an error on your part or our part. We will make sure that it's corrected. Or if, if, if we are correct, you are wrong, I'll get back to this. The other thing is that suppose, suppose I have a number, 0 0.022. Clearly, this has two significant figures. Because these two zeros, these two zeros don't matter. Let me erase this thing. So suppose I divide this number by 2, precisely 2. Now you see I have a problem. Because I have a number with two significant figures, 
and I'm dividing that number with something with one significant figure. Therefore, my answer loses accuracy because I am mixing two numbers in which one of them has lower significant figure. So my answer should be 0.01, only one significant figure. I can't write 0 0.011. That would be incorrect because that means I divided by 2 and I didn't lose precision even though I only know 2 uh, to one significant figure. If I write 2.0, by the way, then I can write this. Now, natural numbers, though, uh, are very precisely known, are, are infinitely precisely known. So if I give you the number 5, and that's an exact number 5, you have no reason to think that that will have only one significant figure. Because it may be number coming out of natural uses. So I'll, I'll get into that in more detail uh, as we go along. So uh, going to significant figures, therefore, requires you to use some uh, uh, judgment of the word, I guess. All right. So let's do a problem. We have a bit of time, so we can do a problem. A uh, problem associated with vertical motion and so on. If you haven't gotten into the web work, please do, okay? Because I want you to get started. Uh, the problems, by the way, they're different than the ones that are in the typical books. Because one of the things, uh, I mentioned this briefly, I think, on last, last week. One of the things we are trying here is we are trying to construct problems that are stru structurally richer, but less in, less in the total number of problems assigned. So usually we would assign more number of problems. And now what you have uh, in this course is we are trying to make lesser problems, but each problem has more parts that are going around some, some theme or some topic roughly uh, to cover a lot of ground. And you will see that some of the problems you are doing now will recur down the road, but you will be calculating different quantities or pulling out more threads, if you will, from those problems. So these problems are therefore not your run-of-the-mill problems for which answers exist, because I made them up. So uh, you have to do them. A uh, couple of things, though. Uh, ask questions. That's the best way to learn uh, as you get stuck. Ask questions. You will get stuck. They're designed for you to get stuck. So you need time. If I give you a week, that's, that's because you need a week. That's not because I'm, I'm being generous. Uh, I'm generous in other ways, but not when I assign homework problems. Now, the other thing is that you will find that sometimes the problems are slightly ahead of you, uh, and sometimes the problems are slightly behind you in terms of class lectures. So a few points I want to make, and I want you to uh, just keep them in mind because I won't be repeating this. When I go through a 101 class or you know, a large gateway course like this, time is really important, and time is uh, very precious. So my job is to cut the most efficient you know, pathway through the course while at the same time trying to be as clear and as rigorous as I can be. Because not all of you have the same background. Some of you have backgrounds that are substantially limited for whatever reasons. There are kids who come here who have been out of school for a while. There are kids who come here who are going through a lot of emotional problems. Over the years, I can't tell you how many kinds of students I've had, and that has made my life richer. But that's a fact of life. And there are some students who come here incredibly prepared who are in this class, and they'll end up in Ivy League universities in the next step. So I deal with a very broad range of kids. One of the things I try to do is I try to cut a path that is the most efficient path for you. That's not what the book does. If I write a book, that's not my job. The job of the book is to tell you the story ground up. So if I don't exist, you have the book to fall back upon. So I don't really follow the book section by section, and chapter by chapter. Each of my lectures typically straddle 
one to two chapters. That said, I have a very clear expectation as far as you guys are concerned. And you should know this. My expectation is that because I assigned you that book, you will go through the stuff that's there, the, the, the material that's there in addition to my lectures, okay? not in lieu of it, in addition to it. You may not want to go through it as rigorously as you will go through my lectures, because again, this is the most efficient possible, number one. Number two, I expect you to not look at. In physics, you don't look at something. You work through it. You sit down with a paper and a pencil, and you work through it. You work through all the example problems in the book that are worked out. All right? You will find that every chapter has a whole bunch of example problems. So in addition to what I do on the board, these go through the example problems in the book. I assume you have gone through them, and you will have a great deal of advantage as long as you have gone through them as you go through the homework. So please be advised about that. I won't be repeating it because this is stuff that I've already told you now and you should know it and I won't be reminding you very often. I just assume you know because that's your job. You get stuck on that, you can ask me a question or you can ask Rance or uh, Kevin questions, but by all means, this is something that uh, you should be aware of. Okay. So let's do, a, let's do a problem. Because of paucity of time, there is only a certain number of problems that I can do. Uh, but let's go through some simple ones. And I'll, I'll, do, I'll do things without calculators, so you'll see how I expect you to do them. So I'll do a very simple problem, a simple ball drop problem, just like I did in the beginning of this class. So in the simple ball drop problem, what you have is some kind of a height here. There is a ground. And here you are, and you drop a ball, a ball fall. So as I told you, you drop a ball means your initial velocity is zero, right? So if you drop it, as I said drop, that means V0 is equal to zero. Uh, acceleration downward, I regard like that, right? And uh, let us say the height to which this ball falls is y. And because I'm dropping it from here, I'll take this to be my y equal to 0 level, which means y downward will be negative. So let's see how things work out, because we have, we have equations 1, 2, 3, and 4, and we are going to try and use it. So I want to do the problems in the following way. First, record what you know. If you don't do problems this way, you will make mistakes, OK? Record what you know. You don't have to write record what you know. I'm just writing it for the first time. But you'll see when I do problems, I first make a little list of what it is I know. And I've already said here that V0 is 0. Uh, acceleration is minus g. Let's say minus, uh, I don't know what, a, what number I used. Let me use for now 9.80 meters per second squared. I'll approximate it down the road as needed. And let us say I time the fall. And the time of fall is 2.50 seconds. Of course, this has known the three significant figures. So I know time of fall t. Time is a scalar quantity. We'll come to why time is a scalar later. And let's say I want to find out uh, first. Well, I, I, find, well, I want to find out two things. What is y and what is the final velocity, let's say. These are two things I want to find out. So that's how I make a list of what I know versus what I don't know. That's why I have clearly, visually available in front of me what it is that I'm after. That's my first list. My second list, and I'm going to run out of space, are the equations. Because it is impossibly difficult to figure out, especially when you are starting out, what equation you want to use or which equations you might want to use. So. I would write down, for example, that distance t is v bar t. I may or may not need that, but that's immaterial. I would write, because it's vertical motion, y equal to v0 t plus 1 half uh, a t square. Or in this case, I, I'll just leave it as g t square for now. I'll put a minus sign here when I, well, actually, I should be careful. Let me just write it as g t square for now. 
and v final is v0 plus gt and then v final square is v0 square plus 2gy. So these are my four equations and I would write it down at the corner of my page just so that I know all my weapons are in place. So I want to find out y which is the height through which it falls and I also want to find out final velocity. So one may be asking how tall is the building? So that basically means you've got to find out why, right? So one may not exactly explicitly say find why, but the question may be how tall is the building? Just so that you know, uh, don't scratch your head too much. It basically means one is asking for why. So why is very simple. Uh, V0 is zero, so I can just use the second of those equations. I can basically write it as one half gt squared, right? Very simple, because I know time. So this is going to be 1 half minus 9.80 uh, meters per second squared, because that's my acceleration here. And t squared is 2.50 second uh, squared. That's how I write it. Observe that I put, it, put the units next to the numbers. Why do I do that? Just so that I don't screw it up. Another one of those little tricks to make sure that I can catch my errors, and I want you to do that. Don't just write 9.80 times 2.52. Don't do that. It's a bad way of doing a problem. You're setting yourself up for errors. Yes. Why use? Why is the 9.80? Because we are going down. Remember, I, I said here that whenever things are going down, next. Uh, so naturally, then y will also be downward because they're going down. So therefore, let me do this calculation simply. All right. So right now, I'll just round off everything, just for the sake of simplicity. So I'll, I'll make this 9.80 into basically 10 meters per second, just for now. That's fine. And just to make my life simple, instead of dealing with 2.50, it's 2 and a half. And 2 and a half is 5 over 2. So I'll just write it like this. Again, this is for class work, it's not for homework with all the sick pages and so on. There you have a calculator. Here you don't. So I squared this. I have 10, I have a half. These numbers are beautiful. So therefore, you have a minus. So I have a minus 5 times, uh, this is 25 by 4. So that will be 25 times 5 is a minus 125. So this is going to be in meters, uh, meters over 4. We know that 30 times 4 is 120. So it, you can take it up to 31, so it's minus 31, and that will leave you with 124, 14, so minus 31.2 meters. That will be the y. Uh, so you can just leave it at minus 31 meters. I won't be complaining if you do that. Uh, in this case, for example, either way, that's a very easy way of dealing with numbers that don't necessarily seem terribly friendly as you meet them for the first time. Now that's how you calculate the y, and the y is negative because we are going downward. So let us, uh, let us go to the next one, which is I need to calculate the final velocity. So that's easy to do. We have lots of tools for calculating final velocity. There are two formulas. We know the height, minus 31. So so for calculating the final was the V final, this is V0 plus GT. Uh, V0 is 0 because I dropped it. So that means minus 9.80. Uh, meters per second squared, right, times uh, time, which is 2.50 seconds. So if I do the calculation, this would be approximately minus 10 times 5 over 2, 
uh, meters per second. So that'll be uh, minus 25 meters per second. That will be the velocity with which it will be just about to hit the ground, before it hits the ground, just at the instant before it hits the ground. So that's a very simple problem. If you look at my lecture notes uh, as posted, you will find that there are a couple more problems like this. And I will, I will go over them very quickly on Thursday uh, and, and teach you some skills on Thursday so we can make the jump to projectiles, which should be the next thing. This chapter, by the way, has a lot of tricky problems. One of the problems that I should tell you, because I have a few minutes left, is I've assigned a problem like this, I think, in the homework. Suppose I throw a ball up. Suppose this is me, and I throw a ball up, it goes up. As it goes up, acceleration due to gravity, which is downward, is going to slow it down. So if I throw this up, it's going to slow down, come to a stop momentarily, turn back around and speed up. So if I'm standing here, if I throw it up and catch it at the same point, the net displacement of this shock would be zero. It doesn't matter where it went, the final minus, final minus initial would be zero. So there is no displacement. There is displacement here, there is displacement there, but if I throw something and it comes back to the same point, there is no displacement. So you can do those problems very, very easily by setting that the net displacement y is equal to zero. Acceleration again would be minus, minus g, right? Whatever v0 is given is given because you need to know that. And then you can calculate, for example, the time of flight and so on and so forth. But it's very important for you to recognize, just like I told you, technically when you drop a ball, v0 is zero. If you throw something and it comes back to the same point, your net displacement is zero. So I will ask you these questions because these are some of the essential skills you take away from doing these problems, just so that you know. Um, Some of these problems are more difficult than others. I, I will mix and match them. If you get a difficult problem, it's OK. You can always ask questions, and we'll help you. Now, oftentimes I'm asked if it's OK to work with my friends. Uh, the answer is maybe, but maybe not. Because at the end of the day, you and your friends won't be solving the problems in class that I ask you. And as I said, my goal is to catch you where you don't know, because that's the only way I know how to assess and evaluate. Let's be fair. So it is important that you learn the skill, which means it is important that you can do what I ask, I, I need to have you do. Okay? So please, therefore, try and learn the problem yourself. So the protocol should be you work it yourself. You get stuck, you seek help. You can seek help from us, which is the most uh, desired thing to do. You can certainly talk to your friends. Uh, do not share your password. Uh, problems are not randomized. Uh, we didn't randomize because we just don't want additional trouble. There's nothing great to be learned. Some problems are very delicate. If I randomize numbers, something doesn't work, it will make things difficult for you. So please, by all means, work them through, and that I think will give you the sufficient skills that you can ace this class. But it's not easy to get to 101. I'm here to help. Thank you.